This is Craig Migliaccio from AEC Surface Tech, and today in this HVACR training video, we're going over boiler operation, zoning, and each one of all of these little components here, and why they're piped the way they are, what their function is, how they work. So if you're somebody that gets overwhelmed by looking at all this stuff that's going on, we're going to do our best in order to bring the camera up close and kind of follow along as we describe the operation of every one of these components. This boiler is set at a max temperature of 190 degrees. Presently it's reading 169 degrees and if we were to come in over here this boiler is already at a high temperature and so our inner PSI is the red and that's 22 PSI. I don't know if you can see that or not. See here's 40, here's 60, it's 20 increments. 20 psi increments so it's at 22 psi watts hot and right here on the gauge you see we're measuring about 168 degrees and that's the supply side the return side is presently at about 160 degrees so if you were to follow this supply and return down there's a manifold right here now this is hollow on the inside so the return water and the supply water are actually mixing a little bit but essentially you have your return water coming up this way and then you have your supply water coming back out this way and if we were to follow the supply I want to show you the cold water pressure so we're just going to kind of come across all of this piping over to here and what you're looking for is this assembly right here and this is a backflow preventer and a pressure reducing valve and so this right here the backflow preventer is not allowing the high temperature water backwards into your supply cold water so this is your potable drinking water and this is the cold water line coming in so backflow preventer is not allowing it to go this way and then it has a vent here on the back if it needs to, to vent the water and then you have right here this is the pressure reducing valve and it's set from the factory at 14 to 17 psi and that's your cold water uh, pressure so it may be at 22 when it's hot but when you initially allow water into the system this is only going to allow 14 to 17 psi cold water in now you can see this little handle right here this is a valve a water valve to bypass these and that was used during the initial fill and that's why they actually took this off because they don't want anybody um, turning this on because the whole point is you might have a, a 40 60 well pump switch for your cold water uh, right here so that means that the well pump would turn on at 40 degree 40 psi and it would turn off at 60 psi you don't want 60 psi of water going into your boiler system that, that would that would be bad and so that's why this assembly is right here now let's go back over to the manifold so you have your manifold right here and if you if you look right here and follow the piping you have a valve to isolate so every single component that you have on a boiler you want to have a valve in order to isolate this off and so this is an expansion tank so you have basically a rubber balloon inside and it's pre-pressurized in the, for a boiler at 12 psi and so you have a Schrader valve up here at the top and so without water in this tank that bladder is pressurized to 12 psi and so when you heat up water it expands and increases in pressure and it's going to take up more space in this expansion tank and so this is essentially a safety device or buffer tank for the pressure for the boiler system so starting right here at the manifold on the return if you look down here there's two drains and those are for flushing the system and for trying to get air out of a system and so you if you were to follow this return over here I want to show you a safety switch so this is the low water cutoff so if there's a major leak and all the water is is not in the boiler piping what's going to happen is this switch is going to stop the boiler right here it's going to stop the boiler from firing uh, so basically it's it's wired with 120 volt power right here and then it has a safety switch so it has these little probes that are in the back in the in the water pipe and so if there's no water present then what it's going to do is it's going to open up the normally closed 
set of contacts. So right here you can see a common NANC. So that's a common wire, like a connection point, and NC means normally closed, so the switch is normally closed and then it will open up if there's no water present in the boiler system. So then it's not going to allow the boiler to, to heat up. Now we're restarting at the manifold just to, so you know where we're at. And so on the supply, which is the supply water coming from the boiler, the first thing it goes into is an air scoop. And so any air that's in the tubing is going to get scooped and kind of rise to the top of this. And then it's going to go to the automatic air bleed. And you see this little cap at the top, that, that is loose. Because it's supposed to purge any air that's in the system automatically by itself. So it's going to go to that air purge first, and then it's going to go next into these, which are mixing valves. So you see a mixing valve on each of these zones. So this is a zoned boiler, and you see there's actually seven zones. So every zone on this one has a circulating pump. So a system is either going to be zoned with circulating pumps or with zone valves. So a zone valve looks just like this. This is a Taco zone valve, and this is the older style. They also have the Sentry version, but you're either going to have circulating pumps for each zone, or you're going to have a zone valve for each zone. And if you have zone valves, then you're going to have usually just one large circulating pump for the entire uh, trim assembly. So in this case, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six. And these are all circulating pumps, and there's there's three speed pumps. So I don't know if you can make this out, but these ones are set on medium. And so there's a low, medium, and high speed for the pumping speed. And then on these, it tells you the current uh, that it's going to be drawing while running. And then each of these have an internal flow check valve so that the water, uh, when this circulating pump is off, does not flow in the other direction. Now you're going to notice one larger circulating pump right here, and this one is for the indirect hot water heater tank. And so that is for the uh, potable water for the hot water for this home. And I'll get to that in a little bit. So coming from the air scoop on the supply side, we have one, two, three, four, five, six mixing valves. And then we have a seventh zone that does not have a mixing valve, and the seventh zone is for the indirect hot water heater tank. So let's just take a up close view on one of these mixing valves and you see that there's a Allen wrench right here and the Allen wrench is used in order to adjust uh, the temperature of the water that's allowed in through this mixing valve. And so you can see you can set a mixing valve from anywhere from 90 to 130 degrees and these particular ones are set for about 115 degrees because these are feeding hot water radiant tubing, so that tubing is touching the wood inside this building in order to transfer the heat. Now to give you an example of how this mixing valve is working, if we follow this supply tubing up, you see a circulating pump right here, and once again you see ball valves to isolate this component. If you need to change it out, you should always do that. But this is running right now, and if we were to look at the temperature gauge right here, you're going to see that it's at 115 degrees as the supply temperature. Now this is the return, and this return is after the water has exchanged its heat in the building, it's coming back down over to this valve and flush point right here, and, and so you have an on-off valve right here. This valve is just there for if you were, gonna, like you were going to flush it or try to uh, push water through in order to purge the air, but anyway, then it comes back into, the water comes back into this return, and then it comes back over to this manifold right over here on the return side. This mixing valve operates because it has a supply pipe right here on the bottom. So picture 190 degrees coming in. So if you have 190 degrees here and say you have maybe 90 degrees coming in this way, and this is the return by the way. So this, this is connected right to the return tubing that's going to the boiler. So after a supply run rejects its heat within the building, it's going to be low in temperature on the return. And that's the water that's being used in the side in order to mix with the supply in order to lower the temperature, in this case to 115 degrees before it gets to the circulating pump. So when you have a radiant hot water heating system, these mixing valves are crucial 
because you have to lower the temperature down. You can't just have 190 degree water touching the building and transferring heat directly to the structure because it will just rip and pull the nails due to expansion and contraction. It will just kind of rip the house apart essentially. So that's why we're lowering the temperature down to a reasonable temp before exchanging heat with the supply water on the flooring. Now each one of these zones, meaning you have a supply and then you have a return, are piped with our oxygen barrier PEX right here. And then these are connected to a manifold uh, at the location nearest where the building, where it's splitting off and going into the different rooms and sections of the floor. Uh, so now that we kind of covered each of these regular radiant floor heating zones, we're going to go over to this circulating pump, which is actually going over to the indirect hot water heater tank. And so first off, we have our supply manifold. So it's coming from there. It's not going through a mixing valve. So you have the potential of having as high as 190 degree water coming through here into this circulating pump. And then the circulating pump is pushing it over this way and in into the uh, boiler. So you see boiler water in. Now what's happening is as it enters here, it's going into a water coil that's going like this. And then it's it's ending right here. So it, this water does not just go into the tank by itself. It's actually going into a tubing coil between here and right here. So this is the boiler water out. And so this would be considered the return. And so you have the return piping coming this way and it's gonna go underneath and this way back over to the main return uh, manifold here and back to the boiler. So that's how it's exchanging heat because this water coil has the water jacket around it and that's the potable water jacket. So if we were to look back up here, remember our backflow preventer and pressure reducing valve, we know that that's the cold water in. So this is the cold water into the boiler and to the indirect water heater and so you have it coming in here and this is a swing check valve. And so it's just gonna go like this, and that's it. So it's gonna be resting in this position, and anytime that the faucet is opened at the hot water uh, faucet, you have this swing check and you have cold water coming in. It's gonna come in, and I'll explain this in a sec, but basically it's coming down. There's an expansion tank for any expansion contraction that's needed, and it comes down into the cold water drain and cold water in, so if you can see that. We also have our main drain right here. So this is just a big, large hot water heater tank filled with water. So we have a cold at the bottom. We've got a pressure relief over here on the side. And so this is a 150 PSI, 210 degree uh, pressure relief valve. So if this uh, water is overheated, it's going to blow out right here. And this pipe needs to be uh, roughly six to eight inches from the ground. And so that's where that's just resting at. So it has to be open in case the relief has to blow the water out of the bottom. So you have your hot water out of the top right here. And so then it's going to go to, say, your faucets through the house and through over to the showers and things like that. Now, what I want to explain is, say you have a run that's maybe 100 feet, 100 feet between here and where you open up your kitchen faucet at. Well, you want hot water there all the time. And so what you have is a recirculating pump. And on the side of this recirculating pump, I don't know if you can make this out or not, but this dial right here is actually set for 130 degrees. And so this, this piping right here is from the furthest run in the whole building, maybe a hundred feet away, actually two different runs that are a hundred feet away at two different faucets. And so these are piped to the hot water line underneath of your faucet in order to make sure that you have hot water present at that faucet immediately when you open it up. You don't have to wait 30 seconds or a minute. So anyway, you are running this piping and uh, the water, you're circulating it constantly until the water that's crossing this recirculating pump reaches 130 degrees, then it's gonna shut off. This, once again, is, is a, a one-way valve, so it's a swing check valve. 
So this swing check valve is making sure that the water is only traveling in this direction. And so here's a drain, and then you have your valve, and then once again it ties into your cold water line. And so it's not going to, to force the water back this way because you have your swing check valve right here, and this is your cold water coming in. So basically you are just continually recirculating the hot water and you're putting it back into the cold water drain in. So this entire water heater tank should be at a high temperature and, and right over here you're going to see this is the aquastat. So I don't know if you can if you can see that right here. This is the temperature control for the water heater and it's presently set at 135 degrees. So this is your dial right here depending on where you move that. This is what's going to control the temperature of the water in this tank right here. So this aquastat is just acting as a switch. It's either closed or open. And so you have two wires in this thermostat jacket and this thermostat uh, wire is run over to here. And so hopefully you can read this, but it says one zone switching relay. And inside of here, what you have is you have your, your, your power right here going to your circulating pump. So this circulating pump is what's taking your hot water, say your 190 degrees from your boiler, circulating it through the heat exchanger in the water heater, and then it's coming back in the return down lower. But basically this is only gonna get powered anytime the aquastat is calling for a higher temperature of water in that tank. Now, right here, you have your, your electric coming in. So you have your, your power in, and then your power out to the circulating pump. And over here, you have your TT terminals, and that's where your aquastat is wired to. And down here, you have basically an N switch. And so that's a NO in common. That means it's a normally open connection uh, that will close any time that the circulating pump is, is running. And so that is going over to a switching relay. So I mentioned that there's seven zones on this system. And so right here we have a six zone switching relay. And so you're either gonna have a switching relay such as this right here, or you're gonna have a zone control. A zone control is for zone valves, but in this case, since we have circulating pumps, this is gonna be a switching relay. So we have six thermostats that are connecting up here at the top, zone one, right through to zone six. Anytime one of those is calling for uh, heat to turn on because of the wall thermostat, it's going to correlate down to each one of these 120 volt wires. And so you're going to have relays in here, right? This is a switching relay. So anytime a thermostat's calling for heat, it's going to allow power, 120 volt power, to one of these wires that connect to the appropriate circulating pump for that zone. And so that's how this is going to operate. It's fairly simple and there's a wiring diagram inside, but this is six zones. I said there's seven zones, right? So you have your seventh zone right over here and this is your one zone switching relay. And so there's also connected inside of, of any one of these is either if it's a one zone or it's a six zone or if it's a four zone, you're always gonna have your XX terminals and that is a, a switch essentially. And you have a thermostat wire that's going to connect to your boiler so that your boiler knows that your circulating pumps are running or basically that a thermostat is calling for heat. So the boiler is going to know uh, that heat is running right now. And so your boiler's job is basically to maintain the temperature at, in an efficient manner. So that's how it works. So I want to explain some of the, the piping and electrical that's on this boiler. So this boiler can run anywhere from 72,000 BTU input to 333,000 BTUs per hour of input. Now, the input is the gas. So this, in this case, it's natural gas, and we have a one inch Schedule 40 gas line coming in. You're always gonna have a valve, a, a union right here. You're gonna have a drip T right here before it enters into the boiler. So you have your natural gas line piped in. You also have a intake. So that's your combustion air. So you have your combustion air coming in and then your exhaust going out, so you have two. You don't wanna take your combustion air from within the building because you turn your building into a vacuum, and then basically, if your building's in a vacuum, you're gonna be sucking cold air into the building from any crack 
uh, or a crevice or around windows or whatever. So you want to have an intake and exhaust installed and piped to the outside. And as well, you're going to see we have our emergency on off switch right here for the entire system. But you don't see the electrical line going directly from the emergency switch to this boiler. And that's because you're going to, if you follow it, it actually goes down to this safety switch, which is the low water cutoff, and that will shut off power to the boiler if there's a problem. And then you have the boiler being uh, powered from there. And so, so that's what you have there. And now let's look down here at the bottom. Because this boiler is high efficiency, it actually extracts heat from the water that's created during the flame process by burning the gas. And that goes through the heat exchanger inside the boiler, and then after uh, the heat is extracted from this water, it then drains over here in a pipe and then goes into this sump pump area. And so this is going to be dripping anytime that it's burning the fuel gas. And so that's why it's able to get its extra efficiency uh, as well as all of the electronics and the sensors in here to have it be operating at an electrically efficient manner. Now I want to show you behind this cover panel right here and you can see that we have our pressure relief valve over here and that is a 30 psi pressure relief valve and that's 650,000 BTUs and as you can see right here there's a little bit of dripping and this should have been piped down to the ground between six and eight inches away from the ground and so we have also our circulating pump right over here for the boiler and then you can see where our gas lines coming in at you have a 90 and then it's coming up to that gas valve and then here's the handle for the gas valve right here. Now this right here is the condensate. So this is the condensate trap and then you have it come up this way and then into this, this line right here and then down into that drain. You also have these uh, flush points right here and also right here. So this is your return, that's your supply and there's your boiler pressure. So I hope this video helped you understand how boilers operate and how, how this all works. So if you want to learn more about boilers, I've got a lot of other videos down in the description section below, such as circulating pumps and zone valves and, and other aquastats and things like that. So make sure to check them out. And if you want to learn more about HVAC, check out our website over at acservicetech.com where we've got a bunch of free resources, articles, quick tips, quizzes, calculators. We also have our refrigerator charting and service procedures for air conditioning book. And hope you enjoyed yourself. We'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.